place for a certain period of time before I can reuse it. Because it's quite an endeavor to get some of these out of the ground, especially during dry times of the year. But you can see that each plant, all I have holes in them, just this specific one, every one of them has holes in them. So let's put, and this is from a, a disturbed area. This is from a conventional crop land field that we have on our farm. So I'm just going to put this material in. I can remember as a child, because I need to tell you a little bit more about my childhood. I grew up on a dairy farm in the Piedmont of North Carolina. So, does anybody else grow up on a dairy farm? Great. You know, there's a lot of work there. <laughs> And it kept me, I, 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 I contribute to it, it kept me out of trouble a lot during my earlier years. Um, which I still did find some trouble. Uh, but <laughs> I can remember my childhood consistent of this right here. Uh, uh, day in and day out, we had to put out a lot of manure. We then chisel plow that ground and then finish this that ground and then finish, usually finish this at more time while we were drilling small ground that we would later harvest the next spring at a green chop or, um, or some type of forage for the, uh, for the dairy cows. Go ahead and see that we just put this in there and I would go into the house. I didn't have any white clothes, or if they were white, they wasn't white very long um, because of just the, the clay soils that we had in that area up in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Slate derived soils from the Triassic Basin. Just placing this in here. I'll just pack it right around the edge. It's just where water doesn't have a tendency to try to flow around the edge. I never thought of this soil as uh, <coughs> other than just soil or, or dirt or maybe, yeah, a lot of times I'm as a child, I just call it dirt. But working within our CS and being exposed to soil health, kind of come to the realization that the soil is actually living or has the potential to be a habitat for living organisms. And all of my childhood years, I just thought we were using this as somewhere to put seeds, right? This was just a medium that I could put seeds in grow that cash crop that we was needing for the most part to feed cattle, feed them dairy cattle and we could make milk. Which I did quite a bit of that as well. I didn't very much enjoy milking. But it paid the bills, it got me through school. It taught me a lot of good lessons. So there's our, our tray for our conventional field. You can see, just place that in there and do back around the edge just where we couldn't just easily flow it by the by the metal that it is installed. So let's move, let's put this tray here. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. So I'll just place this on. So this is to mimic those rainfall events that we get in the summertime. Now, if you're out from the, the uh, past the Midwest where you get very little rainfall, this would still apply. Um, but we're in, in the southeast, we're or the south for the most part. We're you know we're getting these types of rainfalls, you know, sporadically throughout the summertime, up to that 40 some odd inches of rain. So what we will do is is look at these different land uses and see how. Uh, efficient they are in being able to harvest that rainfall. And also think about how we're going to harvest sunlight. It's going to take solar panels, right? So we got some solar panels here, we got some solar panels here, here, we got solar panels here. This is from the understory of a forest plant. Um, so of course there's a lot of solar panels up there. This is just from the understory. So I want y'all to form an opinion because we're fixing to get, you know, inch, inch and a half rain. That's the thing about summertime is we might get a couple big drops and we may get, you know, a couple inches of frog strangler and just water is running everywhere. So we want to see how efficient these are. I want y'all to form an opinion and see which one do you think is going to be able to harvest rainfall. Maybe one of them, maybe all of them. So just go ahead and form that in your, in your uh, own mind and let's get this thing started.
So, uh, you know, just a little bit of trivia. We've all got caught out in a, in a rainstorm. Yeah, them raindrops have quite a bit of impact. So how fast do you think those raindrops are traveling? Somebody said 32? A little bit, a little bit slower. 15? Another guess. Right, a little bit low. 25. 25, a little high. So let's, right around 20 miles per hour is how fast a raindrop is traveling. So we can see that you know, there's a lot of impact that a raindrop has. And as soon as we turn this on, we already see some, uh, some effects of that raindrop. We can see on that, on that disturbed sample that that soil is being displaced. Those, those soil particles are, are being displaced and they have the ability to move at that point. So these jugs on the front will catch water that is leaving that site. And as a, a, as a vegetable producer, or a producer in any type of, of crop, I'm immediately concerned with that, that management style. Um, because the, the number one key transport of disease to a plant is from soil being splashed up on the, on the, to the, sol the foliage of, of the plant. So you may be thinking, what is the difference? Of course, these are different land uses, but we have two cropland samples, we have two pasture land samples, and we have one forest land sample. But the biggest difference that we have between those is, is the management that is on them. And when we talk with producers, we have the ability to talk to them about soil health planting principles. The first one, and these are very simple, very easy to remember. Um, and, and we encourage producers to think about those. Someone may want to grab that bag and go out there. <laughs> I think they got the drain back here, but they're great, and I think it's a little bit out of whack. Um, drain broth man was going to sleep that day. Um, but those four soil health plant principles, they're very simple and short, where producers can remember those. Even folks like yourself can remember those and think about how they're going to impact the land. Because the first of those is minimize disturbance. I didn't say take out disturbance. I said minimize disturbance. The second is to have uh, maximize diversity. Diversity above ground is going to usually result in diversity below ground. The third is to uh, maximize living roots. Have living roots in the system year round. Then the last one is to uh, maximize soil cover. You can see obvious reason. Even if we have disturbance in a system, we will want to get that soil back covered as quickly as possible. Um, work with a lot of producers in vegetable, in vegetable production. They may have disturbance in their systems, but then they would mulch the systems as quick as possible to where they can intercept that raindrop. I want to slow it down a little bit. So that's the thing about weather. You know, we may get uh, in, uh, intense downpour there for a little bit and then it tapers off for a while, but we'll still see that the, the results are going to be the same. So you can think about those soil health planting principles and how they're related to these samples. And see some of the results. Is anyone kind of amazed that the two samples in the middle are really running neck and neck of water that's not being harmed? So I'll give you more information about these samples. I told you this was, uh, the one closest to me is from a forested site. It's got pines, it's got uh, hardwoods, it's got um, understory growth. So it's mixed, diverse, and there's very little disturbance there. The second one is from a rotational graze pasture. So when I say rotational graze, there is um, uh, cattle there maybe a couple of days, up to seven days, and then they're moved to another pasture. The one in the very center is from a continuous grade pasture. So old Bessie, she can come there any time of the day, every day, and you can see a little bit of clover that's sticking its head up. She's going to come and wrap her tongue around and she's taking it with her. She's going to move on to the next little blade of clover that came up and, 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 and just do that across that entire pasture. She has free reign of that pasture every day, all day. And then, uh, the middle sample, of course, was a from a disturbed a conventional system um, where there's quite a bit of disturbance 
And actually that farm, before we picked it up, had vegetables. Sweet corn um, and other vegetables that was grown. We've now since moved it to a, a system like on the end, which is a, a no-till crop field um, with cornmeal, soybeans, and then we see cover crop. So that cover crop, I told you that that soil was on a river bottom soil, and with all the rain that we've had, that field has actually been under water six times this year. We actually lost the crop. It had soybeans on it, but we lost that crop due to all the flooding this past fall and winter. But it had the cover crop. And the thing is, I didn't seed that cover crop. I seeded it years ago, but through managing the covers over the past year, it's had new species covers since 2007. So that is a Dixie receiving prince and clover, so at some point in time in my management that the clover was already made productive seed, and that is the result. There is a little bit of rye in there and some vetch, but the prince and clover, I guess through the conditions that were uh, uh, imposed on that field this year, the, pro the clover was uh, picked for uh, to have the most benefit of coming up, even though it was under water. Uh, but I'm, I'm really pleased with the amount of uh, Growth that we have on that field. Uh, really, really in bad, uh, bad spirits with a lost crop and then not being able to recover put back on. So that is those management, and we talk about those soil health planning principles, and that is how they're going to, uh, we can relate those to them. So we've had that rainfall event, and we talked a little about the, the soil health planning principles, and we've seen that we were not able, or we wasn't very efficient in harvesting much rainfall from these two cities. <laughs> so let's look at those soil health planning principles and discuss those with these samples. We'll start with these two. So we want to minimize disturbance. Now this one is in perennial grass. This is pasture. So what is the disturbance? Mm. Hooves, that's right. So we, a lot of times producers would only think of disturbance as being some type of building. It could be a planter, it could be a, a, a disc, it could be a plow, it could be something. That's the only thing they think of in terms of disturbance. But when old Bessie can put her hooves here every day, she's creating a disturbance on that system. This one has disturbance as well. It's just that we're managing that disturbance a little bit more, a little more intensely. And we can see that there was very little water Nearly none. Just a little bit, and also a little bit there that was uh, not harvested. So we can see that there there, there could be some room for improvement on, on minimizing disturbance. So let's look at diversity, um, keeping a diverse uh, a, a diverse above ground forage. So when we have above ground forage that is diverse, we are going to support. Of, uh, the populations of soil biology. So one thing we talk about with, with producers is they may be a row crop farmer and they're just thinking about row crops. Well, every time we have this demonstration, they walk away from that knowing that they have just become livestock producers as well because they have to manage for that soil biology. Because that is something that the soil health plant principles can cater to and, and they need to think about the, uh, the importance of managing that soil biology to increase the soil health. So I, I throw this word soil health around quite a few times. If for, what would you think in terms, and you can think if you have a garden or if you have crop production land, what would you think in terms of your soil if it was healthy? What would your soil have? What's that? Humus. Humus? Okay, could have humus. Organic matter, humus. What else might it have? Lots of bacteria. Lots of bacteria. That's possible. This system has a lot of bacteria in it, and the, actually, the high disturbance has kind of catered towards that and favored that. And even in this system, with the high disturbance, we could be a little bit more bacterial in this system because that disturbance is creating a, a favorable habitat for the bacteria. For so NRCS has de defined soil health as the continued capacity of the soil to function. 
key word right there, function as a vital living ecosystem to support, to support plants, animals, and humans. So my, all my years of thinking this was a medium, I have just found out that this is a living ecosystem that is a habitat for soil biology. So as a producer, I want to manage that as much as I can to make that the best place for the soil biology to live. And we can do that through following those four soil health plan principles. So let's just think, I know y'all are not from Myrtle Beach, but Myrtle Beach gets impacted by tropical storms on occasion. We got it twice last year. Um, so, yeah, a storm comes in and tears up everything and we have to rebuild. So when we have a lot of disturbances in systems, that soil is constantly trying to rebuild. So we see that there's evidence of that biology being here because we see the glues. These are the glues that were in that soil that the biology had, is in process of trying to put that soil back together. The, 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 the high disturbance has, has released those glues because the aggregates are not, are not stable. So let's, and why, why we would want to have diversity is to, of course, to support that, those different communities of soil biology. But each one of these root, system, root systems in these cropping systems or forages is exuding out different chemicals or different substances that support roots. Some people may like steak, some people may like salad. The soil biology is the same way. Different biology is going to look at different things and look at that. And I would say this area around the root tip of our plants, is, we can relate to that as a feed trough. That's where the, the soil biology comes to feed because there's a give and take relationship between roots and those soil microbes at that area. So we want a diversity of above ground. I'm growing cash crops up here, um, corn, wheat, soybeans, which is not a very diverse rotation. I did throw cotton in there, but I had the ability with cover crops to even make that rotation even more diverse to where I can support more biology in the soil because these systems could be more highly bacterial. I want to bring in a fungal component of that because we look at a system like the forest land which is very highly fungal. So that's why we want to have diversity. So keeping uh, the soil covered year round and even in systems that have disturbance, keeping it covered is critical and we can make inroads on trying to make some improvements. Because when we have soil that is not covered, those soil particles then can be de detached. So if the soil particles can be detached, what else can be detached? The life. The life. The life. This, the topsoil is the most crucial part of our soil that we're trying to manage. So we could lose it, for one thing, through erosion. But let's just think about if we put inputs on this as well. I can remember putting a lot of manure on ground like this. And then if we, we did it in, thanks, uh, in thinking that we were going to get that into the ground. That's what we were creating a uh, condition for. So we want to keep that soil cover where we can keep these soil, these soil particles in place to where we're not losing that soil. We want to intercept that raindrop to where we can dissipate that energy. Because 20 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour is constantly hitting that soil surface. It doesn't matter if it has cover or not, we just want to buffer that, that, uh, that raindrop. And we want to keep living roots in the ground year round. And that kind of goes back to that diversity um, principle because if we don't have living roots in the ground, then that soil biology is looking for a place to be. Um, a good way to relate this is a lot of times we'll get together for Christmas as a family. Let's just think we don't get to eat again until we get back together as a family in Easter. Several months there. But let's think about, anybody, that's a chuckle, yeah. But let's think about our cropping systems. We harvest crops in the fall, and a lot of times, unless cover is established, they may lay their fallow until the next spring before another living root is planted into that soil. So what is that soil going to feed on? Any ideas? They're going to continue to feed on each other. And then they also can feed on residues that are on the soil surface from the last crop. They could also uh, feed on organic matter that has been built up. They may break down those aggregates and start taking that organic matter that has been protected in those systems. So that's the reason we want to keep living with We want to keep that feed trough out there year round to support that biology. So with all that said, we have producers that are getting more and more interest in having management styles like this and like this. 
and they think about how they can take their system looking at those soil health planning principles and, and change systems like this or like this to mirror this. So you may ask yourself, why do I have forest land? You know, there, there are people that manage trees for a living, usually large acreage, but why would I have forest land here? Let's think about goals. As a producer, he needs to set his goals on how productive he might be. So all he needs to do is, is look just adjacent to most of these field sites and look and see how this is being managed. Now who's managing this for the most part? He may have, they, they may have some input there. They may be thinning, they may be burning, they may be doing some kind of tree release or something. But who's for the most part managing this? Mother Nature. And she has a tendency, even though we get at odds with her sometimes, she has a tendency to do things right. So while we can see that landowners are saying, light bulb moment, ah, those soil health planning principles are a lot like how Mother Nature farms or how she manages. So can we implement them on our systems to where we can meet all those and be as productive, and especially harvesting, well, I didn't do that, harvesting rainfall when we have those events. Because we see the jugs on the front that caught the rainfall that was not harvested, but we have jugs under these trays that show the water that was harvested. So this is from our cropland field. This one also from the cropland field. This one from the continuous graze pasture. This one from the rotational graze pasture. And this one from Mother Nature, from the forest inside. So we usually get, you know, some comments when we see this. So let's think about that. Why do all of these samples not add up? Because this is, again, this is not research. This is not research. It's just a demonstration. But it is pretty calibrated. If I had all these trays up here without the trays on here and just caught the water, they would be pretty equal. So why do you think some of these have different amounts of water and others have a, uh, different other ones. Absorption. Absorption? Yeah. What's that? Isn't it absorbing the water? It's absorbing the water. But what in this soil is absorbing the water? What is holding that water? Air pockets. Air pockets? But I'm looking for something a little bit more specific. The density of the materials slowing down the force of the water. That is some of it. I heard somebody say a sponge earlier. What makes up that sponge of the soil? Organic. organic matter. Organic matter. These samples have probably, this one I think last time I checked was around three to three and a half percent organic matter. This one is two, two and a half. This one is around one. This one is at a half a percent or less. And this one is at about two to two and a quarter percent organic matter. So why do I say that? What difference does it make how much organic matter does? Well, Organic matter has the ability to store water. So 1% of organic matter has roughly the ability to store one acre inch of water. So if you're in a place where irrigation is very prevalent, that's 27,154 gallons. So this one can store, what, 70, 80, 90,000 gallons of water per acre. This one, 75. This one, uh, 27,000 gallons. This one, 13, 14,000. This one, again, 75,000 gallons per acre. So these, these profiles are storing some of that water in these, in these paintings because organic matter is usually within the top couple of inches of the soil surface. Unless we have very healthy systems that have aggregated and, and pushed that organic matter deeper into the soil profile. So that's how important organic matter is. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Two outside ones are, are fairly similar in organic matter. Why are they so different from a from a how? You got it. You got it there. I just sold time. 
These three, these four are the same soil type. This one is this river bottom. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So if I would have had uh, a, one of the cropland fields, and I apologize for not having everything. No, no, I understand. But that, that is one of the reasons. That is one of the reasons. And of course, with this setup, some of this canopy could have dripped some water off of the pan as well. So with this, I mean, we see some results of this and producers are seeing these demonstrations and be like, okay, I need to do something different to some extent to where I can start managing those soil health plant principles. And a lot of times it takes, you know, management. There's huge differences you can make in these systems very quickly just by managing the frequency and intensity of grazing. You're managing that disturbance. There could be compacted layer, there is compacted layers here, so they could use a piece of equipment to relieve that compaction, but then they, it is imperative that they change the management or it'll be right back to that same situation again. And you may say, well, well why, how does it come back even if you, you change it? A lot of times we think of, we think of plant roots um, as just something that a plant has. A lot of times we don't even think anything below the soil surface. As a producer, we're just focused on the above ground portion of any system that we're dealing with, cropland, uh, pasture land, or, or the, the uh, forest land. But a lot of times we can allow and employ roots to do a lot of different things, and also that soil biology. In, in rooting systems, we can uh, relate, closely relate the amount of above ground forage to the amount of the low ground roots that we have in the system. So if we have a lot of above ground grass forage, even though we're going to graze it off, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot deeper roots in that soil profile. So let's think about that soil profile again. Let's think about that as a bank. If I got some more access to the entire bank, because I'm not farming in a flower pot. Um, so I want to have roots that can manage and get to all parts of that soil profile until it hits a restricted layer that it just can't go through. So that's why we would want to, to manage those systems. This one would have very short roots. So in this system, if you run into a two or three week dry spell, you're going to see drought stress in this very quickly. Okay? Another thing producers are running into, and this is, it doesn't matter what kind of system you're in, um, but herbicide resistant weeds. So how can we at uh, these soil health planting principles kind of help with managing uh, to help, you know, to face that challenge of herbicide resistance. Well, we can keep that soil covered for one thing, because a lot of times that our small, our, our, our herbicide resistant weeds are usually very small seeded and take sunlight to get to them. So let's just think, in most, most years, we can see there's quite a bit of canopy here, but usually it would have rye six foot top as well. So when that is terminated and laid on the ground surface, it's basically completely shaded that entire ground. So small seeded weed species are very much suppressed in those systems. Where we do not have much cover, um, then of course, even in this system, you can see bare ground in this system, that those weed seeds would have the opportunity to come up and grow. 